How you feeling, Mission TEDx? <laughs> all right. Well, happy to see you all here, and thanks for showing up, and thanks to everybody at Madrone Studios for putting this on. Um, so, let me... All right, I'm a biologist by birth, and that's one who studies life, and ultimately, in studying life, I ultimately found myself wanting to study water, because ultimately, as I will get into it, every living organism on the planet is by volume mostly water. And so we are truly um, water-based little water babies, if you, if you will, and, and such. And so here is the title. Uh-oh, we're cut off there. Oh, good, not here. Rethinking and Retrofitting for Resilience. So I'm really interested, again, in, in the idea of rethinking and, and how we're going to rethink this, and then we better retrofit, and there's this ultimate concept of resilience. And I live and work in Occidental at the Arts and Ecology Center in Sonoma County, and I run this Water Institute. So you can see that's an acronym for Watershed, Advocacy, Training, Education, and Research, and certainly have a look at our website there. I guess in starting with water, what I'm mostly interested in is, is do you see water as a noun? as a thing, as something you can surf on, as you could ski on, you could throw a snowball at somebody, you could swim in it, you drink it, or do you see it as a verb? Do you see it as flow? Is it action, is it noun, or actually is it both? And the beauty of it is, is that water has this amazing cycle on the planet, and it's one of the great flows of the big elemental forces of earth, air, fire, and water on the planet. Water's really important. And so I think what, what we really find there is that actually the water cycle and the life cycle are the same cycle. And so we get into sustainability. The question really is, is about our ability to sustain the cycles of life and taking care of the water cycle as the very foundational cycle for the presence of life, I think, becomes ultimately critical in our cities and lives. And so as a biologist, when I look at all of these amazing critters that live up at our place at OEC, I live in an intentional community, not just with a bunch of bipedal sacs of saline solution, known as humans which I do, but also all of these other organisms and life forms and all of the five kingdoms of life that we share this amazing planet with. And I had the blessing of going to Tibet with Betsy Damon and some Tibetan filmmakers and visiting sacred Tibetan Buddhist headwater shrines and temples in High Himalaya and looking at, at the relationship they have with water and their reverential relationship with rehydration, these water-powered prayer wheels. Every little creek would have this amazing little water-powered prayer wheel, and there was just a level of, of reverence about water. And it just it gave me that warm and fuzzy feeling when I came back to the States here about how deeply, deeply we're committed to water and the value that we have with it, right? And how much we honor water and <clears throat> really recognize it. I guess if the solution to pollution is dilution, then getting a jelly donut down your gullet, you could use some pure water nearby, so it's a pretty good business model at some level, right? I mean, <laughs> fair, fair way to go at some level, right? And at some point, as Luna, Luna Leopold, who's the son of Aldo Leopold, read the book Sand County Almanac, um, this idea that the health of our waters is the principal measure of how we live on the land. And so the quantity and quality of water and how do you evaluate the efficacy of your human settlement in place through time as judged by the quantity and quality and the health of your waters. And so using water as a benchmark, if you will, to evaluate that. And the fun part is, is that, let's get clear about it. You don't live on planet Earth, people. You live on planet water. This is the planet. This is the one. This is the great, amazing 70% of the surface of this planet is water. We're spending all kind of bank going to the moon and to Mars right now looking for crystallized water. I so am not going to be the first person to sign up and head to Mars to like go to move on to Mars. I'd be so unemployed as a biologist, right? There's no life there. For somebody who studies life, this is the planet I want to be on, right? This is the one. This is the game. And we live in this amazing planet. So if water's the principal measure of how we live on the land, and you're now clear that you live on planet water, then water is also the principal measure of how we're living on the planet. And so y'all tell me, how you think we're doing? How, how's, how's Gaia feeling about the current state of, of the, the human occupation on the planet? How's, how's it feeling? You happy with it? Right? And so the interesting thing is if you look at some of the work of, say, the folks at the Intergovernmental Climate, the panel, Intergovernmental panel on Climate Change, this is this group of 2,000 scientific institutions from all over the world. This is the consensus of the scientific community. Game on. Global warming is happening. It's absolutely got a human anthropogenic footprint to it because of the combustion of fossil fuels foisted upon by the oligarchy, right? And guess what? There's something called the greenhouse effect, and that's an amazing effect that there's certain gases and water vapor and things that retain heat inside the planet, and that's been a really good thing. But in the process of extracting, us extracting these resources and burning them, that blanket's getting thicker. 
So the greenhouse effect with a thickening blanket yields global warming, and therefore out of that, a warming planet climate will change. It's not that complicated. And those are not euphemisms that are interchangeable. There's the greenhouse effect, which is a process. The heat retaining gases increase global warming, and as a result, the climate will change. So don't let the folks, the climate deniers, try to mix you up on your, on your understanding of the sequential relationship. But what we find here, and you can look at this, the, the ideas up here, is that warming is unequivocal, and then we look that there's basically increases in global average air temperatures and ocean temperatures, this widespread melting of snow and ice, as witnessed in the current state of the Arctic, and then this rising global mean sea level. Right? It, it didn't say rising global nice sea level, because when the sea level comes up, it ain't going to be nice. It's a global rising mean sea level. And then you get into ocean acidification, if you will, get into droughts and desertification and fires. And what all of the fundamental indicators of global warming, or you might even think it's global weirding, because you're, it seems weird. It's like, well, I thought it was warming, so why do we have snowmageddon? How come there's snow, but it's warm and it's raining? All of them fundamentally share the fact that they're all water-based indicators. It's ocean, water temps, melting, snow, ice. It's all water-based indicators. And that's basically because of this. And there's this amazing process. Water is, one of, is the most unique molecule we have. It's the H2O molecule, right? It's got them two hydrogen ears on it, that big oxygen face, big old Mickey Mouse molecule, right, with the two ears and the plus charges, the negative charge on it. It's a polar molecule. It's bipolar. Should pass that for its therapy issues, right? It's got bipolar issues, or at the rate things are melting up north, is bipolar a real estate opportunity in the Arctic? Can I buy some polar now that there's no ice on it? I mean, imagine that what happens is you all know this that when a solid melts to a liquid, it's a cooling reaction. You got a fever, somebody rubs an ice cube on your head, you feel like you're cooling down. And then you sweat, and the sweat goes to vapor, and you're cooled down, right? Evaporative cooling, evapotranspiration with plants. So that cooling reaction, so if the planet's running a human-induced fossil fuel fever, which it is, 1.4 degrees Fahrenheit, on average temperature increase in the last 100 years, if you want to break the fever, what are you going to do if you live on planet water? You're going to have to change the phase state of water based on this equation up here. So you're going to melt all the solid you can to turn it into liquid, which is why all of the glaciers around the planet and the poles are melting and Greenland is melting, right? And then you're going to move the liquid to gas as fast as you can, which is why we see precipitation yielded by storms and big cyclonic typhoon hurricane energy moving heat out of the tropics and northward. So it shouldn't be global weirding to you at all. You should understand it's actually quite pretty clear. What do we do about it is another, another deal, right? And so I work a lot with the idea of, um, oof, that's harsh. Um, work a lot with salmon, it's totem salmon. And this gentleman, Freeman House, who wrote a book called Totem Salmon, says that the first thing we learned from salmon was that the watershed was a unit of perception. And I thought, how, how um, humble is that? And, and what's interesting, as far as I can tell, is ultimately the unit of perception that's got to get it is right here. It's in the headwaters of the system, which is the water in your own head. It's right up here. We have to mitigate cerebral imperviousness to infiltrate the information and get to what I call ecosystem restoration, right? So how do we restory the ecosystem? And as far as I can tell, the TED and the TEDx world is all about storytelling, and it's about a restoration of what is your perception. Is the planet a community or a commodity? Are you part from it or a part of it? Is your city just the wealth of the private property of a corporate tyranny to impose upon you? Where do you get freedom out of this deal, right? Is it free dumb or free dumb, D-U-M-B? Take your pick. Do you want to participate or not? And at some level, what I look at when I'm thinking about this understanding is that I think like a watershed. And I want to see watersheds as my living lifeboats, as my world canoe. And I want to ba basically look at from the summit to the sea, from ridgeline to river mouth, in the entirety of the basin of relation, every human land use, whether it's rural, suburban, forestry, ranching, agriculture, obviously urbanization with City Point 2.0 here, 2 here, every human land use is up for a complete rethink and a retrofit to be resilient to rehydration since planet water and the very ability to sustain the cycles of life, which is water, is core to the future of your city with respect to how well it will perform in the future of global weirding, if you will. And so I'm, the Occupy movement for me is to occupy that living lifeboat. This is a watershed consciousness movement here. 
But that's a perceptual thing. And so I, I work a lot with engineers and land use people and urban designers and folks. And for a long time, we've had a sense that water was the problem and we just needed to pave it, pipe it, pollute it, profiteer, plunder it, make it go away. The opportunity nowadays, and thank goodness we have a Clean Water Act to actually reinforce and make this legal, is that we actually have to see water as, as the solution and then we're gonna slow it, spread it, sink it, share it, store it. But you gotta slow it, spread it, sink it, think it first. And so again, we're back to the headwaters here. And at some level, you either believe in the drain age and the age of draining everything and you can dehydrate and desiccate and degradate and, and, and degrade Make it go away. I don't know, has anyone been away? You know that phrase, the sky's the limit. Well, we've reached the limit of the sky in how much carbon emissions it can hold without overheating the planet. So there's no away. So moving from the drain age, we have to move into the retain age. How do we retain it? How do we reevaluate and rethink our homes and see our roofs as above ground wells to store water in tanks for use later for irrigation? How do we see the water off the street as something to harvest and slow and spread and sink and put it back into the land and grow food and, and, and have an integrated uh, hydrologic relationship with our home and our place? <clears throat> and I've worked a lot with a number of organizations on this idea of slow it, spread it, sink it, and the, the uh, the RCDs, like the Santa Cruz RCD or the Southern Sonoma RCD, these, these booklets we put together on greening stormwater, how beneficial use and management of stormwater are up in the Okanagan Basin of British Columbia. So really, if you want, you can find these on the web, and they have an amazing assortment of tools in the toolbox for how you can retrofit and rethink your settlement to be beneficial in the management of greening stormwater and see it as a solution. And again, the woman I went to China with, Betsy Damon here, this quote here that as, as water is the foundation of life, it must also be the foundation of design and the built environment. And so really when I lead as a designer, as a permaculture designer, I, I wanna ask what would water want? And how, how would I work with water? Like I, I'll hold a sign saying willing to work for water. And what does that look like and how do we, the, the, the deal is, is I'm not here, I'm not interested in depressing y'all, I'm just interested in moving forward the fact that as a designer, I lead with the idea that planning is best done in advance. Right? Planning is best done in advance. And so preparedness, like community preparedness, watershed preparedness for what, we, what is certainly changing and will come, the fact that the predictions for California for the loss of snowpack in the next 100 years in the Sierra Nevada, which currently supplies over 80% of the state's water supply, is snow that was a solid state on the Sierras and then it melted slowly and filled up those reservoirs and it comes through Hetch Hetchy all the way over here to San Francisco or through the McQuallamy all the way to the East Bay. The estimates are pretty much on average 75 to 100 years out there will be many summers where there will be no snow. Many winters will there be no snow in the Sierra Nevada. 80% of California water supply is gonna melt away in 75 years on an annual basis. So we've got to rethink the city and use the ancient East Indian proverb where you catch rain where rain falls. We have to get place-based and source controls and really redesign the foundation of how the city functions. Some cities have really gotten into this, and Portland's a really interesting city for a whole bunch of reasons, but like San Francisco, they, they have a combined a sewer and stormwater system. So what goes down the toilet and what runs off the street go to the same pipe. And they've had to figure this out. So they looked at a bunch of watersheds and they had a conventional drainage network here and they were basically gonna spend 144 million bucks to just pave it, pipe it, pollute it, and make it go away. And a bunch of the folks up there said, oh, we don't really think so. We think we want to do source controls and figure out how to increase the spongification of the system, the softness, the greenness of it, and we're gonna come up with a different design, and so what they did is they developed in the same watershed a much more green infrastructure watershed-based system with green roofs and rain gardens and softscapes and porous pavements and such, and disconnecting downspouts from roofs and moving that into the landscape. And if you can see the details there, they basically It'll, if that plan is gonna cost 86 million bucks, a savings of $58 million, while you have a more livable, greener, water quality improving, salmon saving, groundwater recharging, wildlife habitat enhancing, and livable, walkable green city. And we're saving 58 million bucks, really? Do the math, right? Follow the money is the classic saying, and the game is, is invest in infiltration, in situ infiltration. 
Los Angeles has definitely gotten on board with this and the folks at treepeople.org and the various watershed councils down there and they basically worked with a community in the Sun Valley watershed in the San Fernando Valley there and those folks would get flooded out with a little bitty rain and storm and they said, they said, We're, we don't like this. What we actually would like is trees and green space and we want some new ball fields. We want our old ball fields retrofitted. We want local groundwater. We don't want the Army Corps of Engineers to just put a pipe and make it go away for 60 million bucks. We're going to do a cost benefit analysis and say that actually we think for 100 million up front, we are going to retrofit this, we're going to pull the ball fields, we're going to put these big chambers in there like that guy sitting up there underneath in that cave. And the stormwater is going to go under the field into that, fill up during the event, and then leak into the groundwater and recharge the groundwater and not even need to go to the Los Angeles River. And they're going to save 400 million bucks over 20 years for an initial 40 up front and get new ball fields, daylight creeks, local groundwater security supply, and flood mitigation. Follow the money. Follow the money. And so they're digging up streets and they're putting in infiltration galleries under the main streets. Of, and then folding that back up and putting the street on top of it. And then doing little spaces like this is called a rain garden where that little interstitial garden space, instead of it being a convex shape that sheds water, we want a concave space that spreads in water. And we're called rain gardens and bioswales and adding softness and landscape to the system and, and beautification. And then this is just a, a, a conceptual image of San Francisco from the Public Utilities Commission here. And so if you look at the map on the bottom, it's a cross section through the peninsula looking north. So to the west is the ocean, to the east would be obviously the bay there. And the bottom half talks about the, the pre-development conditions where it, was, where it was wetlands and bays and sand dunes like Golden Gate Park's on a bunch of sand dunes. And then you look at the middle one there and that's the depleted polluted groundwater state, the current state. And then you see the top one. And basically what they're proposing is what, how the, the performance of the bottom with the existing one on the top marry those two and join them into one vision where we've got rain gardens and porous pavement and recharge basins and, and roof water harvesting systems and fog water harvesting systems and daylighted creeks and, and trees and we disconnect the sewage, the sewage the age of suing everybody in a litigious society. Get it out, because remember, you are what you don't defecate. Think about it. Garbage in, garbage out. It's, you are what's left as a bipedal sack of saline solution as a little waterling on planet water. And so get it out and slow it, spread it, sink it in the landscape. And at some level, then basically the game is, is form follows function, and are you smart enough to be a part of the solution or part of the precipitate? Can you precipitate the change that's needed to live within the precipitation cycle and balance your water budget within the boundary of your city to have a hydrologic relationship with place and step up and speak truth to power? And if Totem Salmon needs to do that at the Board of Soups, then by all means do it. Wear shorts because if it's a hot day in the city. And ultimately, I'm, looking, I'm interested in a conservation hydrology that has a regenerative, rehydrative retrofit where we receive, retain, release, recharge retrofit for resiliency, every human land use becomes a water absorbing, water purifying, water cleansing structure. And in my case, the creeks will then be clear, cold, and copious for coho salmon as we interconnect it. And so with that, I thank you for your attention and I look forward to you guys doing the work.